We are having a look at the colors of magic as it pertains to creating D&D villains once again. I'm Connor. And I'm Jack. Welcome back to Building Better Dungeons. Hmm. Um, in particular, Building Better Villains, that's really what we've been talking about for a very long time <laughs> on this channel. The dungeons will come, the dungeons will come. Yeah. Create your villains, and the dungeons will We're come. We're hiring an architect next week. <laughs> um, so, again, uh, the colors of magic are a really useful uh, way to think about your villains. Um, you know, if you try and write a really detailed character, that can be great, uh, but when the players surprise you, and your players will surprise you if they're worth their own salt, uh, then you need to be able to understand where your villains are coming from. So the Magic the Gathering color system is quite like alignment. We've done two videos on it thus far. You can have a gander back to, um, although this one should be fine to, to jump right in. Um, each of the colors has their own sort of personality, their own way of doing things, their own philosophy and how they view life. And we are particularly looking today at five different combinations of those colors, not just um, the color by itself, but the color with another color and not with any other color. Today, we're specifically looking at the colors who are with their uh, as, as we say, enemies. Hmm. So we invite you once again to look at the reference card. Mm -hmm. um, on the back of every Magic the Gathering card, there's these set of the five colors, and the way they're arranged is deliberate. The colors get on with their neighbors, and they don't get on so well with their enemies. Neighbors being the colors beside each other on the Pentagon, and enemies being colors opposite each other on the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And so, whereas when we talked about the allied color pairs in our previous video, we spent a lot of time covering their... Uh, what they had in common, the overlap of the Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, oftentimes the enemy colors are about, they usually disagree on a big axis. They have a conflict and they, the space that they, you know, they have to come to some sort of compromise over it, which can be quite interesting. Um, so what is our, our first uh, color combination that we're going to look at today, Jack? So our first color combination is the combination of white and black. Oh, enemies as old as time. So, as we talked about in our um, monocolor, single color uh, videos, white is the color of community. It's the color of structure and order. And, you know, it's the color of the state and the government and that kind of thing. Whereas black is the exact opposite side of that spectrum. Black is the color of selfishness and ambition and, you know, uh, any crime at any cost so long as it benefits me. Hmm. So, I mean, white looks at black and it says, you're so selfish. You know, everything's better when we work together and you're just working for yourself. How do you, how do you live like that? And black says, no, it's, you're the one who's crazy. You know, uh, everyone needs to advocate for themselves. You're not, you're creating all this structure. You're telling people how they should feel and what they should do and what's best for them. You don't know what's best for them. They know what's best for them. And that's, that's where black comes at it. Um, so this is an interesting dichotomy to have like as, as a central tenant. Um, and there's a couple of different ways you can think about it in regards to your D&D villain. But uh, first, we're going to look at it through, uh, for each of these, we have a card that we think uh, typifies the color combination quite well. And then we have a pop culture villain. So before we crack into how you can use it, we'll, we'll explore it through those lenses first. So what is our first card here, Jack? So our first card is um, Ethereal Absolution. Uh, it says, creatures you control get plus one, plus one. There's the white part of it. It's saying, Oh, all my guys, they're they're gonna be bolstered. Everyone on my team, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a great time. And creatures your opponents control get minus one, minus one. Um, and this was the thing we were talking about in the white villain a little bit, but it's much more prevalent uh, in the black white villain. White people on my side, they're good, they're great. All our guys are great. Black says, ah, everyone who isn't me is kind of a bit of a you know, I don't like them. I don't like there's me and there's not me. Uh, yeah, for anyone reading the card text, there's also a bit that is less philosophically relevant about, uh, you know, turning corpses into spirits that work for you. Um, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the main thing here is black-white. When it comes together, it says, um, yeah, the community is so important. It's so important that we band together. But like a very particular version of we that, you know, we dictate like a small group. Mm. Um, so organized crime is often a thing people sit, talk about as being yeah. black-white. You know, they care so much about their family and so little about anyone else. Um, and so that's, that's really what you have here in Ethereal Absolution. Um, one rule for me and another rule for you. Um, and that's, a, that's an interesting space for your, for your villain to occupy all by itself. Uh, who is the pop culture villain, um, the villain from culture that we're going to talk about today? So the villain we've decided to talk about is actually Magneto, specifically the Ian McKellen later of Magneto, not uh, Fassbender. But 
his whole shtick is there are mutants and mutants are getting treated so well. So he decides to organize this, you know, band of mutants for himself and strike out against the world. Being like, look, we're the future. We're the guys who write. Oh, just, right. just in case you don't know, uh, mutant is in the Marvel universe. Oh, yeah. Some people are just born different. They're born with powers. Um, and they're not always born with a great control over their powers. So people are quite rightly spooked by mutants. When, when mutants walking down the street, you're never quite sure if they might get angry and explode. Or <laughs> <laughs> That's just true. Some of them do just explode. And so human, humanity is somewhat understandably um, you know, very afraid of mutants. And Magneto is there watching all the, the humans treat the mutants so terribly. They're, they're so afraid. They're so angry. They're so, it, you know, it's, it's so unfair. And Magneto says, no, this is, this is not right. Uh, this is not how it should be. And Magneto says, I will do whatever it takes for like, my people, we mutants, to come out on top in this scenario. So he's quite nice like that. He takes mutants who are out living on the street, who are ostracized by their peers. And he, he takes them and tucks them in under his wing. And he says, everything's going to be all right because we're going to murder all the regular <laughs> humans. He's not always about murdering them. You know, it's, uh, he, but like, he's, he's not above it either. And Black doesn't want to go around killing absolutely everyone for no reason. But Magneto says, all right, well, these particular group of humans are causing us trouble. Is the simplest way to deal with them killing them? Hmm. Well, that's how we'll deal with them then. And uh, there is a certain kind of, uh, everyone is a little bit like this. Like everyone has hmm. their friends and the people they like and the people who they don't know and are naturally biased against if any kind of friend, not friend conflict comes up. Um, but for it to be the central tenant to your personality, then you have to have something kind of peculiar going on. Um, so the it's 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 a really interesting uh like dichotomy for your villain to be having um and it, it, it like they, they make a really good leader of a criminal empire like we said before or um, if there's like a racialized minority you know if lizard folk are getting a, a tough time in your uh in your world if they're being treated by the state quite badly then it makes sense for a white black person to come and become in charge of the lizard folk for someone to say we got to take care of ourselves because no one else is going to take care of us for us mm -hmm. and perfectly happy to potentially steal some regular folk Oh, that's that was that was a racist thought by itself. Steal some <laughs> mammalian folks' um, children and have a good snack if you know the if the food is being stolen. The lizard folk, who else has the lizard folk to eat? Um, yeah, that, that that kind of idea is a is, is an interesting space to explore. All right, um, and it can even you know be kind of extra plainer. Like you could kind of imagine a group of angels, right? Mm. Um, say. All, all you people, you're, uh, you're, you're sinning and you're creating all this evil and it's hurting the, my patron deity. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the worshippers of my patron deity, we're really important. You know, it's, we're, we matter. I care so much about them. <laughs> and all the rest of you really better fall in line or heads are going to roll. Mm, exactly. Black White is where you definitely see families of superiority, you know, races who believe themselves to be superior. Any collective who acts selfishly in themselves... Uh, is, is there anything else or will we pop on to our next? Uh, Let's dive right into our next color combo. All right. Um, so leaving behind white and black, and we have today, well, they're all today. We, <laughs> we have uh, right now blue and red. So uh, blue and red are totally different. Um, so that kind of be going, but that's not about selfishness at all. Um, neither color is very like concerned with other people, honestly. Uh, blue is all about perfection through knowledge. Blue says um, improving your conditions and your world is the absolute best thing um, that you can be doing. And red is all about freedom through action. Red's like living in the moment, being passionate, doing what you love, loving what you do. Um, and it's really, really interesting actually, uh, when red and blue get together, they fight on, the, what they disagree about is how you should live your life. Um, blue says, planning is what's best, thinking is what's best. You know, leave your emotions behind. They're clouding your judgment. You need to to become the best version of yourself, you need to leave that stuff behind. And Red says, no, I'm not me if I don't have my emotions. Like, you're, you're barely living at all. You're living a lie. If you're, like, feeling everything through five layers of, like, walls that you put up to protect yourself, live in the moment. Be free. Plans are for people who don't know how to improvise. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what Blue says, well, improvisation is for people who don't know how to plan. <laughs> <laughs> and so when they come together, that's that's quite a, a like, a, 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 a gap to bridge. Hmm. It's, it leads to a lot of uh, central conflict, um, but how it, it can express itself in a couple of different ways where you have creatures or people trying to get ahead in the world, um, you know, with their knowledge and with their understanding, with their blue side, 
but being fueled by a red passion. It's their creativity that's the fueling their inventions. It's their sheer force of will that's um, fueling their, you know, stint through magical college. And in Magic the Gathering, it's the creativity that often really uh, gets emphasized. You know, creativity is where the brain and the heart meet. Mm -hmm. um, in, in some uh, schools of thought that uh, the designer of the game, Mark Rosewater, really does believe in. And that really leads into the card we have to talk about here, uh, Thousand Year Storm. So what's going on here, Jack? So Thousand Year Storm is a payoff. It's, it's um, Thousand Year Storm. When you cast spells, you cast copies of those spells. You go wild. You explode outwards. Specifically, if you're casting the spells that are much more um, opportunistic, spells that could have a bit of an opportunity cost, spells that are fast and good in the moment, Thousand Year Storm says, hey, yeah, let's roll with that. Let's make more spells. Let's copy them. Let's let's be creative. Let's be wild. Let's be spontaneous. Hmm. But within the realms of, you know, magical artistry. And so this is the kind of thing that other colors would have a little bit of difficulty engaging with. You know, um, like what's happening in a Thousand Year Storm is some red-blue uh, force has created this gigantic maelstrom of magical energy and spells are like, you know, magnified and doubled in, in strange ways that no one really knows what to deal with. Mm. And the red blue mind, the one who's like, all right, I can, you know, I can try and get the better of the situation. You know, blue by itself would say, oh gosh, that's that's pretty hectic. I don't, I don't really want to be involved in that. That sounds dangerous. Mm. And red by itself would say, well, that sounds boring. You know, it's like, it's crazy and that's kind of fun, but like, it's complicated and I don't like that. And blue red comes in and it's like, all right, I can take advantage of this system. I'm in the best position. Mm. And you know, green and white are saying, gosh, that's, that's hideous. That's dangerous. That's like, and it's so individualistic. Green, white are, are the two colors of really value community and structure and being a part of an order. Mm -hmm. They kind of look at this and they say, oh, that's a, you know, all those people, you know, <laughs> it's so narcissistic. You know, they're such show ops. And Black says, this can't be the simplest way for me to get what I want. So I'm not interested either. <laughs> um, and so that's the kind of thing, um, creating wild and wacky space. It's a, uh, that's where blue, red uh, villains can really shine. You know, create like oftentimes, um, like your blue, red villains might change the face of the world around them. Like, they, you know, their, their shtick might be, oh, well, around me, reality is going to be a bit differently and I'm in a good position to take advantage of that. And maybe your players are too, if they're creative enough. Um, and also the idea of, I want to make something so crazy. I want to create something so awesome. And if, you know, I, I want to build like this amazing invention. I want, and if, if other people get hurt while I build it, I mean, Honestly, it's worth it. Who cares? <laughs> By the end of the day, I'll have this really cool thing. Uh, so we, to our the villain in popular culture that we're going to have a look at, mm -hmm. um, here is... Aperture Science. So blue and red is definitely the color oh, of... Sorry, from, from, from the, the, those video games of Portal, if you're, oh, yeah. if you're not familiar. Yeah. Uh, so blue, green, blue, green, blue red, red is definitely the color of the mad scientist. Blue red is genius brought into that twisted mad space. And that's represented really well with Aperture Science and especially their catchphrase, we do what we can because we must. <laughs> or, no, I actually think it's the inverse. I think it's we do what we must because we can. Oh, <laughs> one of those anyway. <laughs> but they're both equally blue red, honestly, <laughs> yeah. because they're kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're being a bit frivolous here. You know, it's um, Aperture Science, they did a lot of harm. They really, they, mm. they took people and they put them in test scenarios that were very low survival rates and they didn't particularly care. Safety is not a blue-red concern. Oh, boy, no. Community is not a blue-red concern. Practicality is not a blue-red concern. And other people who don't deserve it having their lives ruined is not a blue-red concern. Um, earlier in the in our first video, I, we talked about the idea that a blue mage might say, ooh, I should create some ley lines to amplify magic in this area. And ooh, oh, like, darn, the, that ley line would have to go right through that human city. Oh, well, time to summon a firestorm. Um, that's actually, that, that's quite a blue-red space to be in. You know, they want to make something. They want to make something cool. They want to express themselves. And anyone in their way is not likely to stay in their way for long. Um, so that's that's the kind of space you could kind of occupy with a, a blue-red villain. A uh, blue-red villain could also be really interested in invention. Um, they could be like someone who's interested in tinkering and like creating death robots. And how are you going to test your death robots? Toss them out innocent people um or i mean specifically that the first person might hunt out heroes to toss their death robots at um it doesn't have to be death robots in, in, if you're more of a D, &D purist who likes the western fantasy as it is you could say constructs and golems you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> but that, that, those are all the kind of spaces that a blue red villain can can occupy and uh when, when your pl players ask like why are you doing this why are you why are you trying to 
you know, kidnap every person in the town and use their souls to, uh, to fuel this gigantic fireworks display. Blue Red Villain will, you know, they are really uh, like uh, embody the phrase, oh, all you people asking why? And am I the only one here who says, why not? <laughs> Uh, but I think I think that covers blue red pretty easily. Yeah. Um, blue red's are in- interesting. You'll, you'll find here that the enemy color villains are a lot more specific. Um, the allied color villains, it made it was more of a philosophy that made sense to hold. Whereas you kind of feel like something went a little bit awry for a lot of <laughs> the enemy color yeah. villains to be coming together. You know, they probably were green white at one point, and then like they were dropped. Or uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's probably a lot of people watching this video who care about the color pie and like identify as it. I know from a fact from r slash color pie, people really like identifying as it's me. <laughs> and uh, I think we should alienate all those people as thoroughly as possible. There might be something wrong with you. Anyway. We're going to edit that part out. Don't worry. Perhaps we will. Although we said that a lot in the previous video, and you know, that, that's all. And after blue, red, we'll say goodbye to both those colors. What are we saying hello to Jack? So the new color on the block is green with the old favorite black. So black, as we said, <laughs> selfishness, <laughs> ambition, power through any means necessary. Green, conservatism, naturalism, the ways of nature, not so much rules, but the lay of the land, the laws of Mother Earth himself. Um, and we are going to represent that with the card Charnel Troll. So the troll is t- slightly too good of a creature. He's a little too big. He's a little too stompy. Um, but he asks for a very high price to be paid every single turn. Um, and that emphasizes green in the sense of dominance and power and raw strength and black in the sense of selfishness and why do you need any other creatures you have me right i'm the best one <laughs> that, that is quite true i haven't actually i didn't think about the <laughs> the creatures uh mechanics and how they fit fed into that kind of flavor uh fed in that kind of flavor because definitely what he's doing here when he, you know removes things from your graveyard he, he's eating them um and <laughs> he's so, wearing bones around his neck <laughs> <laughs> this this kind of uh like uh, that's, a, that's a side of black we haven't talked about too much actually black's willing to pay prices you know black looks at this creature and the creature is like well i'm awesome i'm great but i've got a high upkeep you know, it's a, you know i'll feed you out of house and home where in ha- by house and home i do mean corpses that you will have to provide me mm-hmm. and black says that's inconvenient it's worthwhile you're worth it yeah. um or you know black's not going to say it's always worth it just because some corpses get eaten but black will, black's the only color willing to, to really pay those kind of prices um, and so Black Green is philosophy is the actual, the underlying um, line that they disagree on is uh, actually determinism versus um, free will. Mm-hmm. Green says, your path's laid out before you, man. You know, it's all about the cycle of life and stuff. It's, <laughs> it, 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 you've got a role in your ecology. It's not like, no, it's not because we all came together and decided it. It's just nature is as nature does. You have to find your space within it. And Black says, nope, I don't like any of that. Uh, what I want, I will do. And what I don't want, I will not do. And anyone trying to tell me to do otherwise will meet the pointy end of my blade. And so when they come together, it's an interesting marriage to have. And there's a couple of different ways they can go about it. Um, black green is might be kind of primary black and leaning into green. Mm. There might be a selfish person who has a lot of ambition, very opportunistic, who's willing to you know, get, appreciate nature and, you know, uh, get in touch with nature just to become like, a, to get some access to powerful druid magic. Mm. A druid of the spores in particular, where they really get a lot of power from rot and from death. Mm. That, that, that's a prime black green kind of space. Um, or, you know, it isn't green, um, this isn't just a nature color. It's also kind of the color for like your wider place in systems. So um, black green is able to kind of navigate that kind of thing quite well. Black can, can have a bit of difficulty seeing how other people point of view matters and green gets that we're all in a community even if mm-hmm. even if green's happy to be the predator it gets that the prey is important mm-hmm. and so black green can actually be quite charming and manipulative in that mm-hmm. way it's uh the green is the sort of the cycle of life and black is the natural extent of that that reminds us that for there to be a cycle of life things must die <laughs> you, you, and then there's, there's the inverse of what i just said where you have the green character who says you know, there's a way things are supposed to be. I don't like how the world is changing. Mm. And they use black ends. They, you know, they believe so strongly in their beliefs as to how the world, they believe in their beliefs. <laughs> um, they have a lot of conviction. Um, and they, they think, you know, I will use black ends to achieve um, what needs to be done here. Yes, over time, the forest will heal and, you know, nature will, will destroy the settlement. But I'm going to hasten that process because I really don't like seeing what the humans have done to this place. Um, that's a very black green space to be in. Um, but uh, our the pop culture villain, um, Udalok, 
Hmm. Um, and actually, I, 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 I did the run-up to this, um, but I'm also going to have to explain who Inlock is, because I'm not sure if you ever got to that part of uh, the second season of The Legend of Korra. I stopped watching The Legend of Korra when they shot lightning bolts into a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoyed the shooting of lightning <laughs> bolts into a bucket. I like that show. That show's got excellent world building. Um, I mean, maybe it's not as good as the original Avatar. But this isn't an Avatar uh, podcast. This isn't an Avatar uh, video essay. But it could we're, be we're definitely a response to the comments. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Building Better Dungeons, episode 11 of our you know, Avatar Legend of Aang watch through. I don't... So your villain's a monk. <laughs> the next villain is also a monk. Everyone's a monk. <laughs> um, in black, green, uh, Unalak. Uh, so Unalak, he was the spiritual leader of a tribe of very naturalistic people. Um, who worked within their environment and tried to have a lot of synergy with it. They cared a lot about the, you know, the, the local fauna, uh, some of which were magical, um, mm-hmm. local spirits, you know, all that kind of tradition and culture, um, tradition and culture. But Unalak uh, saw the advances of the modern world, and he's like, he thought to himself, "This is not going well. And it's having a negative effect on the spirits." Um, and there was a time when spirits roamed the earth um, like we do, and they've been sealed off, and that's that's a mistake. That's wrong. Mm-hmm. And so Unalak decided that he was going to open up that gate. And if he just decided to, that he was going to open up that gate and didn't really care what happened, he'd probably be on a green. But it was really his ends, oh, sorry, the means, um, you know, that he took to achieve those ends that, that he was very duplicitous. Uh, he stabbed his own brother in the back. He told a lot of lies and he didn't, and other people helped him not really knowing what they were in for. And that was not a, you know, that, that, those, that's not really a green things to do. Green by itself is not a color that enjoys deception. Green wants to live, you know, wants to have its heart in its sleeve. It really has to be corrupted by black to be that complicitous. Mm. And then when Unalak succeeded and opened the gate to the spirit world and a giant spirit came through, Unalak said, well, wouldn't it be great if I was in charge and really awesome and powerful in this new world order? Mm. And then he, he fused himself with it and uh, became like an unstoppable domin- abomination of, that had to, will have to be stopped. So unstoppable is a bit of, you know, spoiler alert for season two of Kara, the stopping happens. The bad guys don't win halfway through that TV show. <laughs> um, but this is a really interesting um, example of how he kind of kept flitting between black and green. You know, he was, he was green and he was using black ends uh, black means rather ugh, for green ends and then at some point he just kind of said you know what? I've done a lot of work here I deserve a little bit more than what everyone else is getting in this situation mm. um, and that's yeah uh, that, that, that explains black green a little bit where black white tends to be you know oh I really like um, these people and I, I consider myself equal with these people the, the, like, at the expense of others black green can often be like oh I like my place in the world but I mean, it could be a little bit sweeter, you know. <laughs> I could uh, bend a couple of rules here and there. It doesn't, we don't gotta be like totally prescriptive about it. And that's a that's that's the space that uh, Black Green is occupying. And all right, Jack, I'll I'll let you have your your talking time. Where are we going next? <laughs> so next, we're throwing black out the window for a brief moment and back to blue. So we're gonna have green and blue. Green, conservative nature. We already got that. Blue knowledge, uh, wisdom. That sort of thing. Progressive. Pro- progression. Mm. And that, that's the big line that they disagree on, right? Yeah. So green wants to return the world to this, you know, natural state where, you know, nothing was synthetic. Everything was this, you know, world order, survival of the fittest, that kind of stuff. And then blue wants to take it back forwards where they're like, oh, no, learning and de- development and knowledge. And that's how you get ahead in the world. Um, so that's where they find their conflict. Um, and you'll see it actually a lot in the different colors we were talking about. Sometimes it's one color using the other's means. So where uh, blue wants to be progressive, but sometimes it needs to learn a little bit about nature to do that. If 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 you wanna if you wanna if you know the world is gonna sink underneath water and you need humanity to learn how to swim with you know gills that they become mutated with, that's you're gonna need to learn a little about natural and natural science to be able to do that. And if you learn enough about nature at the extent where you can replicate it in that way, that you, you probably have a lot of respect for it. You probably like the cum green. Mm-hmm. It's difficult to learn about nature in this purely technical way and actually appreciate it and get enough out of it to be able to, to get what you want there. So, um, I mean, like a lot of like bioscience is quite blue green. There's a quote um, that I saw from a, from a girl who, who won the scholarship that I've been going for. She was, she was, she was going for a biomaterials college course. Um, and she had a wonderful quote where she said, um, I think that, you know, humanity still has tons to learn from nature. We can progress by ourselves, but um, I think a really ripe avenue for progression is seeing how nature does things. And you see this all the time. You know, scientists 
they study how ant colonies behave and form structures um, for like, you know, the, their own little nanobot uh, experiments. Or, you know, we're still learning, studying mostly animals with four legs, learn how to build four-legged robots. Mm. Um, and it's that kind of thing. You, you get very into blue-green. It's difficult to be totally clinical about when you're actually getting into nature enough to appreciate it to that extent. Um, but what about the inverse? Well, if, if you have, like, you know, progression blues ends with, you know, using nature green means, what, uh, what would a conservative who wants to return to a better time using knowledge, information, and progress look like? Hmm. So that's where you get your, you know, druids, multi-classing wizards. You get someone who has this maybe natural ability or learned talent, some in intelligence, ways with magic, who understands, as opposed to coming at it from the progression point of view, starts off with a deep respect for um, the earth. And maybe they understand, man, I've done the maths and yeah, climate change is going to kick in about 27.3 years. So we're going to have to start doing something about that now. <laughs> Um, yeah, especially you can have, um, whereas the, the blue splashing green is saying, oh, I want to achieve something. I'm going to look to nature. The green splashing blue could really be, oh man, I love nature. I love, or I love these traditions. I want to study them. Mm. And in an interesting way, green blue can often be the historian and um, green blue loves the culture they're from, is proud of it and wants to know as much about it as possible. Mm. Um, and I, I, I like that, that vibe, um, that vibe brother. Um, black and red and white, they don't, they don't really look into the past too much. And blue spends a lot of time looking into the future. Um, but you know, when blue and green get together, they can really appreciate like heritage and where you're from. Um, and that, that, that's, a, that's, a, a, that's a positive aspect. We're not talking about positive aspects today. Um, we're talking, you know, if, if, if blue green makes good historians, uh, they, they make good historious, histor historian villains. Um, so who's our character, Jack? Or what's, so, this, or, or what's the card? The card we were talking about for uh, Blue Green is Prime Speaker Vanifar. She's an elf. She's an ooze. She's a wizard. She's got everything going for her. And her shtick is that she takes a creature you have and she mutates it into a more powerful creature. You know, and the mechanics of how this go down is, you know, oh, maybe that creature dies and is reborn as a more powerful creature. This blue doesn't really care about the nitty gritty details of, you know, sanctity of life, you know, persistence of the soul. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's much more interested in progress. And this is progress by a green method. It takes a creature and it makes it into a more powerful, a more dominant creature. Mm. Um, another thing actually is uh, investigation and learning more things. It seems very blue, but it's also very green. Blue and green, they, they, they both like learning new things, especially about themselves. Mm -hmm. They just disagree as to where that information comes from. Blue looks outwards into the world. Blue wants to go to a library. You know, blue wants to figure that out. Whereas green wants to put its metal to the test and see what it's made of. Green looks inwards. Green, you know, blue researches, green meditates. And when they come together, they're willing to do a horrible fusion of the two that results in taking what was probably an elf wizard and giving her a little bit of ooze. <laughs> her arms are see-through. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they're glowing bright blue. It's a little hard to tell. But she does have gills. <laughs> I guess it's an aquatic ooze. Or, I mean, maybe she's also part fish and just couldn't fit it on the card. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that idea of um, taking things and wanting to make them better, but like taking people and turning them into other stuff is is actually a really horrifying thing that is quite in blue green's pedigree um because if it was a white uh figure it might like care a little bit more about your individuality you know it, mm. might, it might say oh, that, that, that's the wrong but it might care about you it might say oh you, you, i don't have the right to go over and kill you and make you into something else that's something black would do um blue green doesn't really have that um <laughs> like oh, the moral compass yeah becomes a bit wavy <laughs> Um, so what's the, the villain um, in, in Blue Green that we're going to talk about today, Jack? So the villain in Blue Green we're going to talk about today are the Reapers from the Mass Effect, Mass series. Effect series, where a man named Shepard, Shepherds are green, I've never played the games. Uh, I also <laughs> haven't played the games. Um, this, this one in particular, we actually had a look at a, there's a great TV trips page, all Magic the Gathering color analysis, mm. which I've spent too much time on, um, and we really need on that for this. Uh, so the Reapers, uh, their whole shtick, it's very simple. Um, they think that if the humanity and aliens in general, if life in the universe, in the galaxy, it's a sci-fi series, is left to its own devices, uh, androids will come and they'll rise up and the synthetic life will become the only life that left. And the Reapers don't like the idea of that. They think that it's important to keep a record of what, what you know, organic life is like. Mm. And so they go around um, turning people into museum exhibits. Um, you know, 
the Reapers really, really care that like you're a piece of history that they could access. Mm. They don't really care how much of a fun time you're having whilst you're in that accessible state. Um, and so it's not a great time if you're uh, encountering the <laughs> Reapers in, or Reapers in, the, in, your, in your general life. It's going to be, they're going to do bad things to you. You're going to think that they're evil, um, but really they have your best interest at heart. Mm. Just in like, like, not your best interest, more like, Best interest of, like, the general idea of posterity. Yeah, <laughs> you're going to survive, maybe as a brain in a jar, but you are going to survive. Um, this this is actually really interesting, actually. To me, Blue Green um, has this kind of sense of, like, it knows what's best for you, and it's going to do it to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and it respects your individuality, right? It, it cares about you. It cares about you enough to make you something else. Mm-hmm. And I think, it, uh, you know, it's probably, like, basing it off to some extent. Um, you know, it's like, Vanifar doesn't do that in the game because it's hard to, to like make that work on a, on a card. Uh, mm-hmm. But you can imagine that when blue-green mutates someone, it mutates, like, it, it, it thinks, like, well, what's the best thing about this person? And accentuates that thing mm-hmm. um, against that person's will. So a lot of horrors can exist in this space. Um, mm-hmm. Slatty, you know, uh, who come from the other realm and say, well, you'd be way better if you looked a little bit more like me, friend. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they, <laughs> but actually, the Slatty are a great example for this because no Slatty is able to make anything look exactly like them. The Slatty have that really complicated reproductive process where they stab you. And then if you got stabbed, you kind of spontaneously are consumed from within by something that becomes a completely different kind of Slatty. And quite like Pokemon, if this happens in the right conditions, um, they can turn into very special, multi, like special colored, shiny versions of this lab, which are much more powerful to deal with. Um, it, that kind of like blue green um, often exists in that kind of space, but it could be more traditional. Like even a blue green villain could just be a human being mm-hmm. who um, wants to push his citizens to the test. You know, he's he's leading an, an army. They're doing a conquest because he thinks he, his people need more more space, mm-hmm. more room, and you'll find that everyone there, all their individual talents are nurtured, that everyone is trained to be the very best version of themselves that they could be, but in a way that's quite eerie and not, like, uh, ironically for green, all, not all that natural, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, the people have been indoctrinated, they're constantly pushing their bodies and their minds to their, their limits um, for their leader, for, their, for, the, for, the, for the state they're a part of. And for the, for the group, you know, they, they love it. They're happy there. But everyone else looks at this and says, oh, that's kind of creepy. I don't, I don't like the idea of that. But this is my enemy. And they're so, I mean, you can't argue with the results. Mm. <laughs> is there any other kind of D&D villain you can have in a, a blue-green space? Or hmm. So any, any villain that wants to push the whole, you know, oh, humanity must evolve to survive. Um, mm. that's, that's, that's a great space to work with. And especially... It's also aesthetically a great place to just pull from the weirder creature side of D&D. You can just... Here's a little sneaky trick. You can just invent creatures. <laughs> so give, um, you know, give an elemental a pair of glasses and call them a wizard. Give, give an ooze um, a trident and call them an elf wizard too. There's a lot of wizards in blue. Um, but it allows you to pull from... You can literally just mash weird creatures together and chances are they'll end up in a green-blue space when you take the natural of green and the unnatural of like blue sentience and intelligence mm. um actually one of, one of the spaces that's interesting for villainy um is that villains don't always have to have the hero's best intentions not in their heart the sentence is <laughs> um, imagine a copper dragon who say oh man you guys are cool i mean you're kind of small fry now though what are you level four and your players will say uh, what, what's what's a level and um, this copper dragon will take them and put them in a maze and say, oh, well, you might die, but if you come out on the other side, you're going to be awesome. And then they'll fly away and the players are in this horrible copper dragon created death trap. That's all for their own betterment. But, mm. you know, who knows if they're really going to enjoy their time in that space designed explicitly to destroy them. Um, but we don't want to spend too much time in blue-green. We, <laughs> this is by, by far the longest one so far. Let's we'll slip into our last color pair. We Not have sure a problem with green. I'm not sure why we did this one last, actually. Um, it's, I mean, there's no real rhyme or order to this one. Nope. Uh, who are these people, Jack? What is these colors? So, these colors is um, red and white. We've chatted about them before. Red is your passion, is your making your own decisions. Your freedom through action. Mm. And then white is your structure, your community, um, your collective. And so when red-white comes together... They're um, similar to sort of uh, white black. Their axis of of um, of uh, contempt conflict comes from red is the individual and white is the collective. And I mean, even even more than that, actually, I think it's uh, really really specifically chaos versus 
order because mm. um, like red is able red is like definitely able to have some friends like red can, red can can vibe with a community mm. um, but red doesn't think the community should have too many rules mm. like white says we're gonna we'll still set up some rules and if everyone follows them it's gonna be best for everyone and red says i hate everything about that sentence that you just said <laughs> <laughs> yeah red red just kind of it wants to wake up in the morning and wants to do what it wants to do and why are you pushing on all these rules man come on and then it you know smokes pot and buys a gun at walmart um but anyway the card we chose to discuss uh for red white is chance for glory which i don't think is actually exemplifies anything we've talked about so far specifically but um <laughs> we're obviously no more pants <laughs> <laughs> we don't know where this is going either <laughs> so Chance for Glory is just that. It's a chance for glory. It says, your creatures, you're indestructible, and you're going to get another turn after this, but it's going to be your last turn. So it says, just in this one moment, make it count, everyone. And it, it's 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 a great example of Red's sort of um, haphazardness. It's passion. It's, all right, guys, I, I swear, one more turn, and if I don't win this time, I'll, I'll, I'll lose the game deliberately. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know... That on its own isn't so powerful. One dude running up to an entire army with a sword and being like, if this doesn't work, that's fine. <laughs> not, not particularly effective. Um, but it's when it, it brings out the community and it brings out that sort of... Um, it brings everyone together and everyone agrees and they back up this one true ideal of like, yes, this is our final moment. Mm. I think um, righteousness and belief are also things that red and white happen to have in common. You know, white really does, a lot of the other colors, um, they're not so willing to evangelize for where they're from. You know, green says, look, it's, it's, you get wisdom through acceptance and you'll learn that in time when you're older or I'll kill you. You know, it's, uh, you're, I'm not going to really help you along there. And blue is kind of like, I think that uh, everyone should be the best versions of, the, of what they should be, but I'm so preoccupied making myself the best version of what I am, but I don't have a lot of time to talk about it. Mm. And uh, Black just does not particularly care about other individuals very much. Black's going to do what Black's going to do. Black, you know, will defend itself if attacked, but, you know, it's not going to go out to the bait halls and say, here's why you should all be more selfish. Because, I mean, Black's kind of happy if other people are restricted. Um, but, you know, <laughs> everyone else playing by the rules makes Black's life easier. But red and white, red says, people are their happiest when they're living in the moment. And I want everyone to be living in the moment with me. Mm. I believe in that so strongly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach about it for days. And white says, no. Everyone is at their happiest when they're together and they're working for a common cause and they agree that there are some rules they should all follow. And I will stand up against Red and I'll scream at Red for hours about how Red is living his whole life wrong. <laughs> and so this real belief in conviction and willingness to evangelize is, I think, what uh, one of the things that can tie Red and White together. And that's kind of what you're getting, seeing here. You know, Red and White, they, they're, they're, they don't triumph necessarily because they're the smartest or because they're the naturally biggest or because they're they're like willing to play to cheat or anything, you know that, that, that willingness to cheat is in black, which red and white don't have, obviously. Um, red and white achieve their triumph through conviction. They mm. believe so hard, and that's what tra Chancellor Glory is really showing here. Mm. You know, there's no logic to it. There's no real rhyme or reason. There's no like green would never do this. Green would accept your fate. Mm. Um, red and white says one last chance. I, this doesn't work. Nothing will. Um, who is our villain in Red White from popular culture that we would like to discuss today? So, uh, the villain we're going to chat about is Ronan the Accuser from the Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Um, and he's a really good Red White villain because, well, one, he's at the head of an army, which puts him in a very white space. He's he's about his community. He's not selfish and he's not... Okay, he can come across a little selfish. He's not, he's not doing the villainous things just for his own personal gain. He's not trying to ascend... Um, in Thanos' ranks, he's not trying to amass any particular um, power for himself. He's just decided, hey, my people have been slighted specifically, and nobody gets one over on my people. It was, it was a bit worse than slighted. Like, in particular, <laughs> he, his motivations were watching. His, there was a very long war between his planet and another planet, and his parents both died in it. Hmm. And uh, the thing that he opposes in that movie is a peace talk um, where, like, a peace treaty actually where the, these two planets that have been at war for a very long time are gonna they're, they're gonna get over their common different they're gonna get over their differences find their common ground and achieve peace and ronan says you know his, his he's so angry about that he's so angry about everything that's happened to him um but he's not just angry about it for him he's not red black he's not saying i selfishly need closure i'm gonna kill people mm. he's saying we collectively are angry about this 
my people don't deserve to be treated this way, mm. that we will have no peace. There will be only triumph on our end. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's no other motivating factors. He's not trying to you know, st- stab back into his ancient culture and bring that to the fore. Mm. He's not interested in innovating anything new, and he's not interested in amassing power. He's not green, he's not blue, he's not black. He's red and white to the core. And that's a really, you cannot convince a red white villain under any no. circumstances that they're wrong. Your red white villains are your um, your fallen angels who have become so angry uh, about the world around them that they've taken to the sword and are punishing sinners. Mm. Um, actually, I remember you mentioned Avicen in the in our mm. white. Yeah, and Avicen definitely has a mo- mono white space story. But actually, we got some comments saying that uh, she, you know Avicen in her angry form when she was purging humans who didn't live up to her standards was was red white. There's definitely an argument to be made there. And um, none of this stuff is super hard and fast. It's a uh... A fact I sort of neglected at the time, but if you flipped over the card I was looking at, on the back side of it is red after she goes mad. So it is it is quite a good example of she's here for the community and she wants, um, she wants the community to do well and really her fury is all based in that. It's She's upset for her people. So actually, I, I think um, as you're listening to this, one of the thoughts that might occur to you is this is the kind of the first color pair where these motivations might not seem very apparent to the players um where from your player's point of view if the villain is constantly you know mutating people and trying to make them be their best selves that's obviously not like that's not a, a, a typical black villain you, you, you can see where all of these things are coming from mm-hmm. you know if someone is like uh helping out their people at the expense of everyone else that's very clearly not a typical villain um you know all, all these things immediately are rockable to your players you know what, what they're doing makes sense whereas the red white villain can just look like a black villain when or a red villain when he's going around the place being you know causing damage when when she's just burning down libraries and you know it, it, it can be difficult to know what's going on without um like hearing her backstory and that's why it, well i mean it's it just conveniently this problem is solved but the fact that red white is the color there that it most wants to talk about their backstory <laughs> you know red and white doesn't want to burn the library down she wants to burn the library down with everyone watching and say i'm burning down this library down because that's what is best for us <laughs> um Red, white is definitely the color of angry mobs. <laughs> yes, definitely, actually. Um, and, and angry mobs are a great d and <laughs> they, they come up a lot because your players will do something to anger some community at some stage, probably several times a game. If uh, <laughs> Not several times a session, but, you know. Um, I, I've, I've had a lot of angry mob situations. We, we won't dwell, but you, you remember. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that's the space your red, white villain is coming in. They're fervent. That They're convinced they're right and they're very willing to crack some heads you know red brings out white's violent side white's willingness to to crack some eggs when uh the community needs protecting and white brings out like a little bit of order to red's chaos that you know like an explosion is an explosion it goes in all directions it, you know dissipates its energy white red is definitely the controlled blast <laughs> yeah um and that that might be it is there anything else we want to Chat about uh, about uh, this color combination, or have we got to the end of what we wanted to say? I think I think we've hit the end. All right. Yep. So um, again, the whole reason for thinking about this is that uh, you want your villains to make sense as people, and the Magic Gathering color pie is a really robust system for creating people, not just villains. Although villains are the central part of every campaign, every campaign is going to have villains, and every campaign is going to have bad guys you're faced up against. Um, so it's most applicable there, I think. Uh, but you can also use this framework to, to create NPCs. So you can encourage your players to use it to create their characters. Hmm. You can uh, use it to create whole societies. Um, it, it's a really useful framework for thinking about. Um, and that's, that's what this is all about. It's about thinking. And I, I guess one thing we've never really specified that um, we might want to say here is that you don't have to be really prescriptive about it. And when I say prescriptive, I mean hmm. um, how a, a white-aligned DM um, <laughs> would, would listen to these rules would say, oh, this is an interesting framework. I like it. I'm going to stick to it really, really rigidly. And that might not be the, the wisest thing, right? You, sh- you shouldn't, in the middle of your DM session, be like, oh, is that thing my, my villain did, is, does that fit their color identity? It's, it's supposed to be to give you an idea of what their character is um, that makes sense. You know, mm-hmm. you don't have to think, oh, who is this person and what are all their motivations? If you can just think to yourself, ah, yeah, that one's black, white. Mm-hmm. And then you, ha- you have that sort of foundation to build off of. Um, in the heat of the moment when your players surprise you and you need to try and figure out what your villain would do in this very specific and convoluted situation that you never could have prepared for um, but yeah I, I think that'll be that um, so this is Jack and I am Connor 
and uh, thank you for listening to this episode of Building Better Dungeons. Bye.